Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. This is the Retroid Pocket 2. This came out in the summer of 2020. It was one of the first devices that I bought and reviewed here on this channel. And I've got some fond memories of reviewing that device about two years ago. Just look at little baby Russ right here putting it through its paces. Now that device was far from perfect. I had lots of issues when it came to the face buttons, the D-pad, the analog sticks, and lack of touchscreen. It was definitely the most powerful device under $100 at the time, but it had a lot of flaws too. Now they improved the buttons and updated the chip for the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, but I feel like the real successor of the RP2 has been finally released. This is the Retroid Pocket 3. And this device improves upon the original one in almost every conceivable way. And while the price has jumped a little bit to $120 to $130 per unit, I still think this is the best deal you can find today. And so in today's video, we're going to take a hard look at the Retroid Pocket 3 and see if it really meets those expectations. Now, before we get started, I do want to address some controversies with this device. The YouTuber Taki Udon made a video talking about some of the issues he had with it, primarily with the screen itself and then some issues with the buttons as well. And we'll take a hard look at that, but full disclosure here, I have two units that I purchased myself. And as far as I know, Retroid did not know that I was the one making those purchases. So I'm hoping that these two units are exactly what to expect as an average consumer. But at the end of the day, I am super impressed with the Retroid Pocket 3 in many ways that I didn't expect. And this is easily the best device that I've tried under $150. Now it's not perfect, there are some really kind of weird design choices here, and if you're not a big fan of Android, that's not really going to change with this device either. But I think overall, Retroid nailed it, and I'm really excited to show this one off. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, let's get started with the stats. Now this has the same chipset as the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. This is the Unisoc T310. And this is a quad core SOC, but unlike with the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, this one has an option to upgrade the RAM up to three gigs. Another big difference here is the display. This is 4.7 inches with a 1334 by 750 resolution. And that is a 16 by nine aspect ratio. This also has a 4,000 milliamp hour battery, which is capable of fast charging. And battery life is great on this. I would expect an average of about eight hours. As far as connectivity, we have 5 GHz Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 5.0, and it also has a micro HDMI port on the top. Now, the RP2 Plus ran on Android 9, but this one runs on Android 11. And according to Retroid's marketing materials, that's supposed to give you a 20 to 30% performance boost. Now, I'm not seeing that at all when it comes to performance, but the overall interface is a little bit snappier. However, both of my devices have that upgraded 3 gigs of RAM. Okay, let's talk about pricing for a second. This starts at $120 and there are six different colors available. But like I just mentioned, there is a three gigabyte option for an additional $10. And I think far and away, it is worth it to spend that $10 to get that extra gig of RAM. Now the price point here is before shipping. I would expect it to be anywhere between $20 and $40 in shipping. And you may have import duties and things like that. And so overall, I'm just kind of calling this a $150 system. Now shipping to Hawaii is pretty expensive. And for that reason, I ordered two at a time. Now inside, you're gonna find a bunch of different like buttons and boards and things like that. That is because you're actually able to switch out the dome switch buttons with rubber membrane connections instead. Mine also came with 32 gigabyte SD cards. I'm not sure if this was a pre-order bonus or what. Either way, yes, lots of stuff in the box here and I'm not going to switch out the buttons in this video. I'm probably going to save that for some time later. For now, let's take a look inside. So number one, it comes with a user manual, which doesn't have a lot of function in it, just some labeling of the buttons. It also comes with a tempered glass screen protector. So yeah, first impressions here, this is actually a little bit smaller than I thought it would be. But overall, I think it has a really nice clean look and design to it. And of course, we'll dive into these specifics here in a second. Now this colorway is called the 16-bit one, but this one here is actually my favorite. This one's called orange, but obviously it's yellow. Either way, I just really like the look of the black and yellow here, and it just feels more like a plastic toy. And for me, that's kind of fitting for a retro handheld device. So now let's dive into hardware impressions. Number one is the feel of the plastic itself. This has the same feel as the other Retroid devices. It's kind of slick and a little bit cheap feeling. To me, I don't think it's a bad thing. It just doesn't feel like ultra premium. If anything, it feels a lot like maybe a Nintendo Switch Lite. Now, the most striking thing besides the smallest shape was how thin this thing is altogether. In fact, I was not expecting it to be this thin at all. We'll do a deeper dive about that here in a second. Now on the back, there's not much to see here. Just a couple exhaust vents. Now this is passively cool there is no fan inside, so it runs completely silent. Now on the bottom, we have a micro SD card slot that has a plastic cover. The cover itself is hard plastic, unlike the previous models. We also have a USB-C port for charging and data, and then a headphone jack. 
It also has two down-firing stereo speakers. Now these are angled more towards the back of the device than the front. And so naturally the sound's kind of just gonna bounce off of your hands as you're holding it. Now on the right side is the home button. This is kind of a weird design choice, but thankfully in the software you have to press it twice in order to get to home. And so I found that I've never accidentally touched it twice in a row. On top of that, the button is kind of hard to press down on. And so really I didn't have any accidental presses across the board. Now, probably most paradoxically, the select and start buttons are on the top of the device here on the right. And that's probably the oddest placement I've ever seen on a retro handheld. What I found is that instead of reaching up top for the start and select buttons, what I do is I slide my finger behind the device and push it from there. It's a little bit weird to get used to, but I would say after a day or so, it didn't really bother me anymore. But regardless, these should have been on the face of the device and not up top. Also up top, we have a micro HDMI port, and we'll test that out later, as well as a power button. Now, another weird design choice is they put the volume buttons on the left. And these are also kind of hard to press down on, and so I never accidentally turn the volume up and down with my hand. But even after several days of use, I kept forgetting where the volume buttons were. Now up top, we have some stacked shoulder and trigger buttons, and these buttons feel very nice. They are clicky, but they have a pleasant, soft kind of clickiness to them. And they also feel very precise. I don't think I would ever press on any of these buttons on accident. And so to me, this is a great design. I can rest my fingers on these buttons with no worry of actually pressing down on the button unless I want to. Now the design itself looks very much like the Nintendo Switch Lite, but these buttons are much softer and take a lot less force to press down on. And I don't get that same feeling like I could rest my fingers on these ones like I can with the Retroid Pocket 3. On top of that, the Switch buttons don't have a lot of travel to them either. Believe it or not, I think I like the Retroid Pocket 3 ones better. Now here is the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. Like with the Retroid Pocket 2, this one also had stacked shoulders and triggers, but the buttons themselves feel just kind of loose and mushy. And so between the three, the Retroid Pocket 3, the Switch Lite, and this one, these are my least favorite. I think overall, there's a big improvement from the Retroid Pocket 2 and 2 Plus to the 3 when it comes to these buttons in particular. Now that's not the only place where there were some improvements. The other one that's a really big game changer is the D-pad. Now I'm pretty sure that the design of this D-pad is identical to the one that's found in the AYN Odin, which I've reviewed here on this channel. These D-pads have a soft clickiness to them, much like with the PS Vita, and they're about the same size as well. And so here, while it looks like there's not a lot of travel, it actually has a very nice precision kind of thunky click to it. To me, this is a great kind of middle ground. The buttons themselves are very precise when you press down on them, and you get just enough feedback to feel really good as well. Here is the Odin Light D-pad, and as you can see, almost identical. The design on the front is a little bit different, and I would say the plastic material on the D-pad is a little bit more slick than it is on the RP3, but otherwise, in terms of size and feel, it's a dead ringer. And like I mentioned, it is very similar to the PS Vita one as well. Now, I would say the PS Vita is a little bit looser in the shell than it is with the other two devices, but overall I think these are great D-pads and some of my favorite for retro handhelds. Now it seems like Retroid took another cue from the AYN devices with these analog sticks. While these look a lot like the ones from the Nintendo Switch, they're actually much smaller and shorter as well. Here in a direct comparison, you can see that the diameter is much smaller, and it just kind of has a looser feel altogether than those on the Nintendo Switch. And again, these are identical to the ones on the AYN Odin devices. So to me, it's a dead giveaway that these two companies must be working together. In fact, if you go into the RetroArch input settings on the Retroid Pocket 3, you can see the control profile they used is also labeled as AYN Odin. And so at the very least, these two companies have partnered in terms of hardware and software. And it makes sense because I don't think that the Odin devices are in competition with the Retroid Pocket 3, which are more budget oriented. And I've seen speculation that these are both owned by the same company or whatever. At the end of the day, I don't really think that matters. I just appreciate the fact that they nailed it when it comes to this D-pad. But I wish I could say the same about the analog sticks. To me, they're just too small and dinky for a device this size. I think at the end of the day, they just kind of erred on the side of being pocketable. As you can see here, the analog sticks barely stick out from the shell. And while I think it's a compromise when it comes to just the overall feel of these analog sticks while playing, I do appreciate that it is nice and pocketable. However, I do think some companies have done better. The Ambernic RG353P, which came out a few months ago, has the same kind of analog sticks as the Nintendo Switch, and they've made them recessed enough that they don't stick out either. And so to me, the RG353P is the best of both worlds. Not only are the analog sticks nice and pocketable, but that little size increase also makes this much more pleasant to play with. 
Now another improvement on the Retroid Pocket 3 are the face buttons. While the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus went for a rubber membrane connection, these have returned to the original dome switches from the Retroid Pocket 2. But in saying that, they are not the same as the Retroid Pocket 2. These have a lot more travel to them, and they also have that nice, pleasant, soft clickiness to them like on the PS Vita. Now like I showed in the unboxing, this comes with button replacements if you want to use them. But I gotta be honest, I'm not really looking forward to changing out these buttons. I like them that much. They are a huge improvement over the Retroid Pocket 2. The Retroid Pocket 2 buttons were just super shallow and hard to press down on, and I found that after maybe 10-15 minutes of use, I didn't want to touch them at all. And I'm not having that issue with the Retroid Pocket 3. In fact, I think these are an improvement over the rubber membrane buttons found on the 2 Plus. Just to show you how far Retroid has come between the 2 and the 3, here is the D-pad from the Retroid Pocket 2. This also had a dome style switch but was super hard to press down on and actually hurt my thumbs over time. I think that the soft clickiness of the Retroid Pocket 3 D-pad is miles better than this one. And like with the face buttons, I actually prefer this over that found in the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. The Retroid Pocket 2 Plus had a rubber membrane D-pad much like what you would find on an Ambernick device or the original Nintendo controllers. And I think it was serviceable, but honestly, with this kind of setup, I prefer the D-pad on the RP3. I think this is also a step forward when it comes to overall ergonomics. The device itself is just much more rounded around the sides, which makes it way more comfortable to hold than previous devices. The only real complaint I have is that I wish it had a little bit of grips right here at the bottom. Because the triggers already stick out a little bit, I don't think it would have been bad to have these little bumps on the back as well. I think it would have improved ergonomics slightly without making this any less pocketable. And man, is this thing pocketable. The overall thinness of this altogether really does make a big difference. Here it is in comparison to the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. While the shoulder buttons and triggers are about the same depth altogether, having the majority of the device at a much thinner size does make a big difference. It's actually a little bit thinner than the Nintendo Switch Lite. It's kind of hard to see in this video clip right here, but yeah, it is a little bit smaller. Not only that, it is about 20% less wide as well, so it is easy to slip in and out of a pocket. Additionally, the analog sticks are more protruding on the Nintendo Switch than they are in the RP3. Now this is kind of crazy, but in my RG353P, I said that that was not a pocketable device, and I actually still stand by that assessment. And even though the RG353P is smaller than the Retroid Pocket 3, to me it's more about the overall thickness. When I put it in my pocket, it just kind of slides in. It's a little bit big, but honestly, it's not that much bigger than modern smartphones anyway. And so if you're one of those people that has like an iPhone Max or whatever they're called in the Android world, this is almost exactly the same size. At the end of the day, I think my assessment here is that this is the largest pocketable device that I own. I obviously have devices that are bigger, but this is the largest one that I own that I'd be comfortable throwing in a pocket when I'm running on an errand. So let's do a quick size comparison against other retro handhelds in the market. Now when it comes to 3.5 inch 4x3 screens like the ones you can find on a lot of the more common devices, you'll see that yes, the size is quite a bit bigger. But also bear in mind that you're getting a lot more screen real estate with this device too. Now that being said, it's not the largest screen in the world. For example, a PS Vita is about the same size as the RP3, but this one has a 5 inch display which is just a little bit bigger than the 4.7 on the RP3. Same story with the RG503 which in fact uses a PS Vita display. But I would say the 503 is a little bit bigger than the RP3. Now moving on to devices that are bigger than the RP3, we have the Ambernick RG552. This one's bigger in all respects, the screen, the size and thickness and everything. Then we have the Nintendo Switch Lite, the Ioneo Air devices, as well as the AYN Odin. Now this one has a 6 inch display so it is quite a bit bigger. Moving up from there we have the Ambernick Win 600, and then of course the Mighty Steam Deck. Now of course a lot of these devices have completely different use cases than the Android based Retroid Pocket 3, but it's always good to get a size comparison if you have one of these lying around at home. At the end of the day, I honestly think the size of the Retroid Pocket 3 is one of my favorite qualities about it. The screen itself is big enough to be impressive, but it's also small enough to throw in your pocket. And it's not very often that we find a good balance like that. Now, like I've mentioned previously, this is an Android based device, and so when you first boot it up, it's going to have some proprietary kind of logos and things like that. It even has a Retroid specific Android setup tool as well. And I'm not going to get into the weeds about setting this up, I've actually created a starter guide for the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, which will work for this one as well. One thing to note is they've added 30 pre installed apps that you can add if you'd like. But to be honest, most of these are on the Google Play Store anyway, and so I only grabbed a few of these that are configured specifically for the Retroid Pocket 3, and that is the PS2 GameCube 
GameCube and 3DS emulators. But my recommendation would be just to go into the Google Play Store and download them all yourself. It's just going to make for a cleaner experience overall. Now, I'm not going to get into the weeds about setup since I've already made guides on it, but two things I do recommend doing right in the beginning is turn your screen timeout from 1 minute to 30 minutes. That way the screen's not going to black out on you if you walk away for a moment. Also, I recommend going into the handheld settings section and then navigate down to the input section and then controller style. Here you can switch it over to the Xbox button style, which will allow you to use the bottom button as your confirm button like it is on the Xbox and PlayStation. That's going to be all up to you, but I found the compatibility works the best with this controller style. Okay, now let's talk about the screens. Now, Taki Udon's primary concern with these screens was that he saw flickering under 30% brightness. And if you want to learn more about that, then I would check out his video. But I will say on both of my units, I have zero screen flickering at all. And I don't know if this is something that Retroid fixed in the software or if I just got lucky, but honestly, most of the reviews I've seen so far haven't had the issue at all. And so, at least as far as I'm concerned, Retroid is a two for two when it comes to this flickering issue. Now, one thing I do want to say is the dynamic range between these two is actually very excellent as well. At the highest brightness, it's very bright, like you could play this outdoors, no problem. But at the very lowest, like on the top here, you can see that it's also very dim as well. And that makes it really good for nighttime gaming. In fact, the dynamic range here is just about as good as on the Odin Pro, which is easily the best I've ever seen on one of these retro handheld screens. Now, fair warning, if I turn the lights off and I keep it at about 50% brightness on my yellow or orange model, I do get a little bit of light bleed here on the bottom left. But I don't see any light bleed on the rest of the device, and the 16-bit one doesn't have this problem at all. And if I turn the brightness down all the way, the light bleed just basically goes away. And so again, I think the RP3 is an excellent nighttime gaming device. Now, while we're still on the subject of screens, let's talk about screen size altogether. Being that this is a 16 by 9 aspect ratio display, that means you are going to have black bars with 4 by 3 content. And by virtue of having a 4.7 inch screen, the size itself is not that much bigger than 3.5 inches with 4 by 3. You're going to get about 3.8 inches altogether on this display compared to the 3.5 inch screen that's already built in with 4 by 3. And so when it comes to playing 4 by 3 content between the two, it's about the same size. But the main difference between these two devices is not going to be the aspect ratio, it's going to be that resolution. Most of the 3.5 inch devices, like the Retro Pocket 2 Plus, have a 480p screen. The RP3 is nearly double that with a 750p display. And so if we use the online web tool from Sean Inman, which will allow you to pick a lot of popular systems and then the consoles they can emulate, you can see here that you just get more bang for your buck in terms of integer scaling on a screen with this resolution. And of course, with some systems, you can just turn off integer scaling and thanks to the high resolution, it's still going to look pretty dang good. And so yes, 4x3 content is going to look just about the same between the two devices, but everything else will be night and day. When I first reviewed the Retro Pocket 2 Plus, you know, that was one of my biggest attractors, is that yes, it could play PSP and you could also do streaming on it, but by virtue of having such a small screen that also gets squished down with 16x9 content, you wouldn't really want to do it anyway. And I think that argument still stands. The RP3 is miles better than the Retro Pocket 2 Plus or any of the other 3.5 inch display devices that try to run 16x9 content. So when it comes to playing PSP or doing game streaming, things like that, the RP3 is a clear winner here. And it also looks great with Game Boy Advance content too. We're getting about four inches of display content on the RP3 versus about three and a quarter with the RP2+. Plus. And my camera isn't picking up on it very well, but the saturation on this screen is miles better than most handhelds as well. The colors are rich and vibrant, the textures are super sharp and just pop out of the screen. In fact, if somebody just handed this to me and said it was an OLED panel, I probably would have believed them. This is easily one of the most vibrant and saturated non-OLED panels that I've ever seen on a retro handheld. And so in that regard, it's just a joy to use. Now, when it came to setting everything up, I actually chose to do this on my yellow one. I just really like this color. And this is just kind of my typical Android setup. As you can see here, I have my emulators, then my games, then my streaming options. And then I have a couple different front end launchers as well. And I've made several guides about this, both for just Android as well as the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. Now, typically I use the LaunchBox front end just because it has a nice streamlined interface. And again, look at how nice these colors pop here on the screen. But I will say that the LaunchBox app is surprisingly sluggish 
storage on the Retro Pocket 3, even though I have the model that has the upgraded 3 gigs of RAM. And so yes, from a functionality standpoint, the LaunchBox front end works just fine. But when it came down to a real world use case, I found it too sluggish for my needs. Now, while we're in here, let me talk a little bit about hotkeys. Now, because the select button is up here on the top, it doesn't make a lot of sense to use that as your primary hotkey like you usually would. And so what I did in RetroArch and some of my other emulator apps is that I mapped the hotkey to the clickable L3 button here on the left analog stick. And it took a little bit of time for my brain to wrap itself around that, but now it works just fine. To exit a game, I set it up for L3 and R3 together. And so instead of using the LaunchBox front end, I ended up just using the standard Retroid one that comes with the device itself. Now I had tested this one extensively, my Retroid Pocket 2 Plus starter guide, and I think it did a pretty good job at that initial point, but they've come a long way in the six months or so since I've made that guide. Not only are the majority of the retro systems now available within the menus, but the front end itself is super snappy and responsive. On top of that, you can change the different views to give it more of an emulation station style kind of interface. And honestly, no jokes here, I am in love with this setup. And there are a ton of different front-end solutions out there. You have things like Dig and Pegasus and the Reset Collection. But I was surprised to find that I prefer this one over the others. It is super responsive and pretty easy to set up as well. It's definitely not perfect, the scraping of the box art in particular is not the best, but I feel like this one gets the job done and does a little better than that. In fact, I would say it improves the software experience, which is not typical of these retro handhelds. Anyway, I recommend checking out my RP2 Plus starter guide if you want to get started because the process is still the same. So now let's actually start talking about performance. We're going to start with the easier systems and work our way up. And when it comes to the low-end systems, things like the 8-bit era, absolutely no problem here whatsoever. In terms of scaling, if you use non-integer scaling, it's not going to be perfect. For example, if we look at the Mega Man 2 life bar, you can see there is a little bit of pixel distortion. Now we can go into the RetroArch menu and go into the video settings and scaling and turn on integer scaling. This is going to give you more balanced pixels, but at the expense of having a smaller screen. And so that'll be up to you whether or not you want to live with those extra bars in the top and the bottom. But honestly, for me, I kept it on non-integer scaling to blow out the whole screen. Thanks to that higher resolution, I just didn't really notice any pixel distortion when I was actually playing a game. Now, moving up to the 16-bit era, this also plays just fine as well. Yoshi's Island is usually one of the hardest games to emulate on the Super Nintendo, and as you can see, it's playing just fine. In fact, you've got a lot of overhead here when using the S. NES 9X Core. If I try another hard to emulate game like Final Fantasy VI, when I turn on fast forward you can see I'm getting between 300 and 400 frames per second. So what that means to me is no matter what Super Nintendo game you're playing, you're not going to get any slowdown whatsoever. And I know I've mentioned it a couple times already, but I really want to emphasize here how rich and vibrant this screen is. There were several times when I was playing some of these games when I said to myself, wow, like this is actually really impressive. The fact that it's happening on a device that costs between $120 and $130 is even more impressive to me. Anyway, moving along here, 16-bit games are going to play just fine. Sega Genesis, same thing. Now let's talk about some of these handheld systems for a moment. Game Boy, Game Boy Color, things like that, they're going to play just fine as well. Obviously, because of the original aspect ratio here, you are going to get larger black bars for these two systems in particular, but it's kind of hard to get around that since these systems had an original aspect ratio which was very squarish. On the flip side, like I mentioned before, Game Boy Advance are going to look just great. This is thanks to the original aspect ratio of 3x2 for the Game Boy Advance. It's just going to look great on a 16x9 display. Nintendo DS also works really well on this device. I'm using a 2x high resolution rendering here. And every game I tried played at full speed. Now the app I recommend using is called Drastic and it is a $5 app, but I think it's well worth it. One of my favorite features about this app is the touchscreen mapping. It works really well on this device in particular. So the way I have it set up is I can toggle between my top and bottom frames by using my L1 and R1 buttons. And then you can just use your finger for the touchscreen and it works out just great. So if you're looking for a device to play Nintendo DS that doesn't actually have two screens, this is one of the better options out there. Okay, let's take a quick detour over to arcade systems next. When it comes to classic systems, as you can imagine, these are going to play just fine. In fact, you can play all the way up to CPS3 on here, no problem whatsoever. And thankfully, now that Retroid is using a true analog stick on the right side, you can turn this over into Tate mode so that you can play vertical shooters like this. And I made videos about this maybe a year or two ago, but basically what you have to do is you rotate the screen here in the RetroArch settings, and then you would want to go into the control settings of the RetroArch quick menu and change out the directional controls on the right analog stick. From there, you just want to save that game remap file and then use that remap file in other vertical shooters. But yeah, overall, I think this works out really well with vertical shooters. It's not the most ergonomic solution in the world. It does feel a little bit wobbly as you're holding it vertically like this. 
but I think the experience is much better than if you try to squish this onto a horizontal display. Now when it comes to fighting games, I found that the D-pad for this is not like a perfect experience for me. Personally, my fingers are used to using something like a Super Nintendo gamepad when playing Street Fighter games. But I think overall the D-pad is nice and precise, it's just a matter of user error at this point. And so if you've ever played a fighting game on a PS Vita and you like that feel, you're going to like the feel here as well. Okay, let's push past the 16-bit systems and move our way up. We're going to start with the PlayStation 1. Now for this one, I'm using the standalone Duck Station emulator. And of all the systems that you'll see coming up here after this one, this is the only one where I upscale the resolution. Everything else seemed to work the best at 480p. But I would say with 90% of PlayStation titles, you can get away with a 2x resolution. Of course, if you come by any sort of stuttering or slowdown, then you can just drop the resolution to 1x and it'll play just fine. So across the board, I think that PlayStation 1 is fully playable on this, no surprises there. Moving up to Nintendo 64, I'm using the Moopin 64 Plus FZ app. And if you'd like, you can support the developer and buy the pro version of the app like I have to give you a couple more features and I think it also removes some ads as well. Regardless of which version you use, the FZ emulator works like a charm here on the Nintendo 64. And again, this is no surprise to me either because the Retro Pocket 2 Plus did a great job with Nintendo 64 as well. This is basically at that stage where you don't have to worry about performance. You can just start up a game and it's going to work. Now bear in mind, we're keeping this to a 480p resolution, but honestly, it looks great on the screen. There was never a single moment when I was playing Nintendo 64 when I thought to myself, man, I wish these graphics were a little bit more sharp. In fact, this has probably become one of my favorite places to play Nintendo 64. I don't really mind the 480p resolution because it feels pretty true to the original console, and the richness of the display really makes everything pop. Okay, moving up from here, I got about a 90% success rate with Sega Saturn using the Yabasan Shiro 2 emulator. This one's a lot like the Nintendo 64 one where you can support the developer by buying a pro model which will give you better features and remove apps. Either way, I kept this one at a native resolution as well and really didn't do any other tinkering other than that. And like I mentioned, I got about a 90% success rate across the board. I would get some slowdown in games like Sega Rally Championship, but it wasn't quite enough to prevent me from enjoying the experience. So overall, I would say this is definitely a Saturn-capable handheld. Moving over to Sega Dreamcast, I had a very similar experience with the ReDream emulator. And with this one, I'm also running that 480p resolution, and it's looking really good and playing just fine. For most of the games, after you've started it up, you can go back into the menu and go into Edit Cheats, and usually there's going to be a widescreen hack available. So I'd recommend trying that out just to take advantage of the full screen here on the RP3. Either way, when it comes to performance, it's a very high success rate with the Sega Dreamcast. But I would say the performance on this is exactly the same as it was in the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. For example, I was always disappointed to find that Marvel vs. Capcom 2 for some reason will not play at full speed on the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. And sadly, it's the same problem here on the RP3. And of course, if you try some of those really hard to emulate games like NBA 2K2, forget about it. This one's not going to play at full speed. But that being said, the overwhelming majority of Dreamcast games are going to play at full speed, and so I would still say this is a capable Dreamcast machine. It's just not quite perfect. Now, moving along, I think the last system you can say will get good performance is going to be the Sony PSP. But I would say there are going to be some drawbacks. Number one is the vast majority of the games are only going to play at full speed if you use a 1x resolution. And while on the other systems, you know, those that were made for a TV screen, it's not that bad to shrink them down to a 1x resolution on a 4.7 inch display. But on the PSP, a 1x resolution definitely shows its age. Now, to be perfectly honest, the original PSP had a very similar size display. I think it was 4.3 inches altogether. And so this one is not that much bigger than the original PSPs, and so you're not blowing it up that much. But that being said, this did feel a lot muddier than the other systems. For example, Nintendo 64 looks nice and sharp, whereas PSP does look a little bit jagged and pixely. Regardless, when it comes to performance at a 1x resolution, the vast majority of games are going to play just fine with no frame skip on or anything. I would say all the way up to OutRun 2006, can play at a 1x resolution at full speed. I would get a little bit of a stutter every once in a while without Run 2006, but it was definitely not something worth going to a frame skip for. Now, of course, not every game is going to play perfectly, and we got to do the God of War test. Now, this one works at a frame skip of 1, but even then, at 30 frames per second, it does not reach full speed. It's very close, and I would say it's playable, but you will get some slowdown from time to time. So, I would say this is not the perfect PSP emulation solution, but it is pretty close. I think it's good enough for me to comfortably say that, yeah, if you like PSP, you'll probably enjoy it on the RP3. 
Now on the other end of the spectrum are PlayStation 2, GameCube, and 3DS. And the only way that you can make any of these games playable is to do what they call sub-pixel rendering. By that I mean you use less than a 1x resolution. For PS2 and GameCube both, you need to use a 0.5x resolution, and even then I would say only about 10% of games are going to play at full speed. And that 0.5 resolution just looks terrible on these screens. In fact, it looks significantly worse than PS1 graphics. Honestly, I think it's so bad that I just can't recommend playing PS2 or GameCube on this device. You're only going to have one of two solutions. Number one, you're going to have games that just don't look as good as the original counterparts, or you're going to be playing games in what is effectively slow motion. And that might be great for games like Mario Power Tennis, you can see the ball coming a mile away. But I think in general, this is just not the device to play those systems on. Instead, I would focus on the thousands of other games that you can play from the previous generations. So, long story short, unless you're a glutton for punishment, I do not recommend trying to emulate PS2, GameCube, or 3DS on the Retroid Pocket 3. Instead, for the rest of the video, I'm going to focus on one of the other strengths of the RP3, and that is game streaming. For my PlayStation streaming, I chose to use the PS Play app. It's one of my favorites. It is a paid app, but it is well worth it with the amount of features and the high bitrate you can get. Here, I've pushed it to a 720p resolution, but with a high bitrate. What that means is the games are going to look really good and play super smooth as well. Now it's not perfect, for example the triggers are not analog. What that means is if you try to play a racing game it's just going to go 0 or 100%, there's no in between. And so for some games like Ratchet & Clank where you can press down the button to give you a higher fire rate, you're not going to be able to have that option. But otherwise when it came to local streaming the PlayStation experience was great. Now unfortunately when I tried to download the Xbox app from the Google Play Store it said it wasn't available for the device. So unfortunately when it comes to local Xbox streaming you may have to use a third party app like OneCast for the Xbox One. Now when it came to local PC streaming I used the Moonlight app and for this I used a 720p resolution as well. And like with the PlayStation app this one worked perfectly. In fact the highest praise that I can give it is that I played several minutes of Celeste on this and I could not tell that I was doing any sort of streaming. And I think that says a lot considering the fact that this game requires a lot of precision. And this is one of those moments where those dome style d-pad and face buttons work out really well with precise gameplay. This was a super good experience overall. And so of course via Moonlight I also did a bunch of emulation streaming too. And so yeah, even though PS2 and GameCube won't play natively on the Retroid Pocket 3, they play just great when streaming them from a PC if you have one that's capable of playing these systems. And so in a nutshell, that would be my recommendation. Instead of trying to play PS2 or GameCube on this device, I think you're going to have a much better time streaming it from a local PC if you have one available. And so in the end, I do think this does make it a very well-rounded machine altogether. Not only can you play up to Dreamcast and PSP with very excellent results, but you can pop over and do some local streaming thanks to that 5 GHz Wi-Fi, and with these really nice controls, it's going to work out really well. And last time I'm going to mention it, but man, I was blown away by this screen. Even when I'm just playing Nintendo Switch games at their native resolution being streamed over to my Retro Pocket 3, it looks fantastic. In fact, I think this looks way better than the Nintendo Switch Lite does when you're playing it natively on the device. And so when it comes to local game streaming, with the exception of Xbox, this thing is a total winner. So now let's talk a little bit about cloud streaming, and for this one I did have some mixed results. Thankfully I was able to install the Xbox Game Pass app on the device via the Play Store, but when I actually opened it up and tried to play a game from the cloud, at some point it just stopped working for me. And so in my initial testing, which I didn't record footage of, yes I was able to stream using the Xbox app. But every time I tried to play after that, it only gave me one option, and that was to install the game on my local Xbox. And so I'm not really sure what's going on there, I think it's a bug with the app, but unfortunately I'm not able to show any sort of Game Pass cloud streaming in this video. Another unfortunate thing is that Google Stadia cannot be installed on this via the App Store either. So I think you have one of two choices, you can either try to sideload that app, and I'm not sure if that'll work, or you'll have to do it via the Chrome browser. In fact, the only real cloud streaming solution that I found that worked really well was through the NVIDIA GeForce Now. And this is free to set up and you can link it with your Steam account and there will be many games in your Steam library that will be playable on this app instantly. But it wasn't a perfect experience. Number one is in order to make the controls actually work from the gamepad, I had to turn on controller mode and there was no way to hide the on-screen buttons. And so that was kind of annoying. Number two, I did get some tangible lag when playing via cloud stream. Now I'm not the best test case when it comes to that because I live in Hawaii and cloud streaming just sucks here anyway, so your mileage may vary with this, but I will say that I greatly prefer local streaming over cloud streaming on this device. And finally, the last aspect I want to touch on before we get into the summary part is HDMI out. 
And when it came to pushing out an HDMI signal, absolutely no problems here. All I used was a micro HDMI adapter and then plugged it right into my capture card. The only things worth mentioning here are that it only outputs to a 720p resolution. And so it's not gonna look like really perfectly crispy and sharp on a 1080p display. But my guess here is that Retroid did that on purpose in order to save on some of that bandwidth so it's not slowing down by trying to give a 1080p signal. And I also noticed when playing via HDMI, there was a little bit of input lag. And it wasn't like a huge amount, but it was enough for me to notice and I'm not one to notice that most of the time. So if that's something you're sensitive to, this may not be a great solution in that one regard. Okay, this review has been going on for quite some time now, so let's start wrapping up. We'll start with what I like. Number one, I think the price to performance on the Retroid Pocket 3 is incredible. Even after shipping and all that, you're looking at about a $150 system that can play all the way up to Dreamcast and PSP with relatively little issues. On top of that, I'm a big fan of this upgraded D-pad and the face buttons as well. In fact, they're so good that I'm not really interested in swapping them out for the rubber membrane connection solution that came in the box. I'll probably end up doing it at some point on one of these two models just to make a video out of it and show people how it's done. But honestly, I'm perfectly happy with not touching them at all. Overall, I think they made a lot of improvements when it comes to comfort. The roundedness of the device in particular makes it feel really nice. And the battery life on the Retroid devices remains very good. I think you should expect about an average of eight hours altogether, which is great. To me, that's kind of in the realm that that's an all day battery. Now, if you're playing more than eight hours a day, yeah, you'll probably have to recharge it midday, but also I'm a little jealous that you're able to play games for eight hours a day. I think for most people, the battery life's gonna be great. And if you didn't already hear me say it 10 times throughout this video, the display on this is incredibly impressive. I think the amount of resolution to size of the display is a really great ratio, and the vibrance and saturation of the colors themselves have to be seen to be believed. And I was surprised to find that this device is actually pocketable. This is easily the largest device I have in that category, and it makes me feel like I can take it anywhere. I was also surprised to find that I really preferred the Retroid launcher over any other third-party solutions. This may be the first and only time where a company actually makes a launcher that's worth using. And finally, just in an overall nutshell, this is a really great streaming device, and it is good for emulation all the way up to Gen 5, and a little bit of Gen 6 in the Dreamcast. So overall, even at $150, this is your best bang for your buck. Now, of course, it's not perfect, and there are a few things I don't like about it. Let's start on those. Number one is the button placement. I can't believe they put the start and select button up top. It doesn't make any sense to me from a practical perspective. It does make the front of the device look very good in marketing materials and things like that, but it just makes it worse to play. I can live with the volume buttons on the side as well as the home button, but the start and select really bother me. I think when it comes to ergonomics overall, it's pretty good. This is a D-pad centric device by virtue of the systems that it can emulate well. But if you wanna play first person shooter style games, especially like when doing game streaming, it's not gonna be that great of an experience. And you may prefer having the analog sticks on the bottom like on a PlayStation controller, but this does not feel like a PlayStation controller at all. I do think that playing first person shooter games is not really the point of the device, but it is one area where it does feel lesser than the others. And some of that has to do with these small analog sticks that they chose to use on this device. I'm a little bit disappointed with this trend from AYN and Retroid. I just think they're too small, but I think there are enough community solutions out there, including a video that I made for the AYN Odin that are gonna make it at least a little bit better of an experience. And finally, as Taki Odon brought up in his video, there are some concerns when it comes to quality control in shipping this device. However, to be honest, all the complaints I found in his video were not present in the two devices that I bought. I had no screen flickering issues Issues, and this idea that apps would randomly crash didn't happen at all either. Now, of course, I'm not saying those issues were not present in his own testing, but they're just not present in mine. And to be honest, a retro handheld manufacturer having quality control concerns is kind of par for the course. We've seen a lot of dumb decisions made by Pow Kitty and Ambernick and the others. And so while I'm a little bit worried that some people will have issues with a retro Pocket 3 as they get them in the mail, I'm honestly not that surprised. These things just happen. But I will say that Retroid has been very upfront about the fact that they will take care of you if there is any sort of problem. And so if you do happen to get one of these devices and it does have one of these issues, just make sure you contact Retroid and they'll hook you up. Either way, typically at the end of a review video, I like to say whether or not it's gonna be worth considering for a purchase. And as you probably figured out from my intro, 
yeah, I totally think this thing is worth buying. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I made a video about the best handhelds under $150. And with the exception of the wonderful pocketability of the MiU Mini, this device, the Retroid Pocket 3, is now the one to beat. Now, who knows, six months from now, there might be a better one out there, but for now, I'm supremely happy with this device. And the funny thing is, the best praise that I can give for this device isn't gonna come from me, it's gonna come from my wife. With all my handhelds, I turn on Dr. Mario on the NES and I hand it to her, and I just let her play it for about 10 minutes, and then I ask her how the experience was. Well, after playing the Retroid Pocket 3, she said, I think this one is the best one yet. And to clarify, this is someone who's tested about 50 different devices, some of them ranging up to $1,500. And she said, and emphasized to me several times after I kept asking her about it, this one unequivocally was the best experience. She loved the super precise controls of the D-pad and the face buttons, and she thought that the color accuracy and the vibrancy of the screen was incredible. And so yes, I think that if you're in the market for a budget retro handheld device, $150 for the Retroid Pocket 3 is the best deal right now. And so if you're interested in checking one of these out, I'll have a non-affiliate link in the video description and you can buy it from there. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.